We're going to start today with Rebecca performing Where Do We Come From? And as you can see, it's going to involve more than one Rebecca. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? What are we? I just love that song. As we begin this morning, I would like to acknowledge that I have made my home all my life on the traditional lands of a diverse range of First Nations and Métis peoples. I was born and raised on a farm just north of the Neutral Hills, and that's a traditional meeting place for Indigenous people over thousands of years. The land where I now live is called Amishkwichiwaskihigan or Beaver Hills House by the Cree peoples. The Dene also refer to it as Beaver Hills House, while other First Nations call it Big House. Since I'm out of memory, Amishkwichiwaskihigan, Edmonton, has also been a meeting place for Indigenous people. These lands have been enriched with their histories, their languages, and their cultures. As a non-Indigenous person, a settler, I've benefited from their presence, their generosity, hospitality, knowledge. I commit myself to actions that honour and respect the spirit of the treaty that was signed in this territory so many decades ago. You may wish to add the name of your territory in our chat. Bienvenue to Wow. Welcome to Westwood, everyone. There is room. A special welcome this morning to those who are first time visitors or consider themselves newcomers or are returning after an extended absence. Today is Mother's Day. The influence of mother in the lives of her children is beyond calculation. Westwood is a compassionate Unitarian Universalist community. Here, you are welcome to explore your spiritual beliefs and decide for yourself what they may or may not be. Here, you are welcome regardless of your gender, who you love, your wealth, or your education. Here, reverence for the earth and belief in the dignity of every person informs our ethics. Here, Music is an expression of our joy. Worship brings us together to celebrate what is important in our lives and acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. Happy Mother's Day. To the world, you are a mother. To your child, you are the world. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back our her very own Reverend Ann Barker. She's been away for a couple of months, getting to know her new knee. She'll be speaking about reaching in today. Sometimes we reach in, sometimes out. This service is part of a set. Today we'll focus on reaching in. The May 30th service will focus on reaching out. After the service today, we invite all of you to stay for coffee hour. 
You can stay in the main room or join a small group conversation in one of the breakout rooms to which you'll be invited. Next week, we'll be joining Unitarians from across Canada for a national service. Check the calendar on our website for the special link. And please note that we will start a little later, 11 a.m., rather than the usual 10.30. Events are open to everyone, and we hope you will be able to take in some or all of them. Today is Mother's Day. Mom, I love you, but I'll never accept your friend request on Facebook. My name is Jacqueline Willett. I use feminine pronouns. I'm your service leader this morning, and I'm happy you joined us here today. Our musician this morning is Westwood's own much loved and much talented, multi-talented Rebecca Patterson. Many others have contributed to the organization of this service, in particular, our worship committee and our communications team. Our tech support for today is provided by Elara Stefaniak Godet and Bill Lee. Today is Mother's Day. Biology is the least of what makes someone a mother. Gildna Radner has said that motherhood is the biggest gamble in the world, that it is a glorious life force. It's huge and scary, and it's an act of infinite optimism. Now I invite Westwood's minister, the Reverend Ann Barker, to rekindle our UU flame. Thank you, Jacqueline. And if you have a candle or a chalice you'd like to bring forward now, this is the time. Our chalice lighting this words this morning are adapted from Rumi by the Reverend Leslie Takahashi Morris and entitled, Come, Come. Come, come, whoever you are, come with your hurts, your imperfections, your places that feel raw and exposed. Come, come, whoever you are, Come with your strengths that the world shudders to hold. Come with your wild imaginings of a better world. Come with your hopes that it seems no one wanted to hear. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, we will make a place for you. We will build a home together. Ours is no caravan of despair. We walk together. Come, yet again, come. At this point in our time together, we pause to recall the milestones in our lives, the joys, the sorrows, the changes. We think of those who need our healing thoughts. Our community is deepened and strengthened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts and by being able to support each other through our joys and sorrows. If you wish to share a celebration or a concern, I invite you to type it in the chat, or you may wish to light a candle in silence.
And I'm lighting this final candle for all those joys and sorrows that remain unspoken, tucked safely in our hearts. Please join me for our affirmation shown on our screen. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Our congregation is entirely self-governed and financially supported by the voluntary generosity of our members and friends. Like many of you, I contribute monthly with an automatic bank transfer. Others make donations via e-transfer when they can. Beyond these Sunday morning services, we participate in a variety of activities free of charge. One of these is our Free Thinkers Book Club. Welcome now to Alexis and JP, who will tell us all about it. Hi, we're both members of the Westwood Freethinkers Book Club, and we're here to explain what the Freethinkers Book Club is all about. Well, simply put, the Westwood Freethinkers Book Club is a book club where we discuss books. Nothing really new there, but the operative word in the Westwood Freethinkers Book Club is the word free. So what does that mean? Well, that means that membership is free of charge. It doesn't cost you anything to belong as well. Free means your thoughts are free of charge. People don't have to pay for your intellectual property. The downside to you is you don't get paid for your thoughts either. So are there any rules to this book club? Yes, it isn't just a free for all, but a respectful exchange of ideas where everyone has an opportunity to express their thoughts. So, how do you belong to this dynamic, innovative, and progressive book club? Membership is open to all. Everyone is welcome. We're not elitist. We subscribe to the seven Unitarian Universalist principles. No application form, nor IQ test, nor financial statements are required. All you have to do is show up on the last Wednesday of every month at seven o'clock, excluding the summer months, during COVID restrictions, we are limited to Zoom sessions and the link can be found at www.westwoodunitarian, etc. When not COVIDing, we meet at Westwood, 11135 65th Avenue in Edmonton. So how do we know which books to read? Well, it's a sophisticated selection process. If you want to propose a book, you're requested to complete the book selection form on the Freethinkers webpage. The form includes things like a brief description of the book, the cost, library availability, and even reviews such as Goodreads. Then, on the last meeting of the year, and that's usually May, you make, a, you make your pitch. As an ethical book club, bribes are frowned upon, and even a donation to the Westwood congregation will not advance your chances of your book being selected, but will be appreciated by the congregation. Threats are also a no-no. Once your proposal has been reviewed, members then vote on the book presented and through a sophisticated algorithm, the votes are tabulated. To ensure transparency, the tabulated results are posted and the successful books are listed on the book club website. So, you may ask yourself, what type of book should I propose? Well, as free thinkers, anything goes. I guess anything within reason, however. Remember, you have to make a case for your book. So something like Webster's French English Dictionary 
probably won't fly. As well, anything that is out of print will be a hard sell. It'll be difficult to get a hold of. And I suspect that a book that has recently been reviewed and discussed at the club is not a great choice. That's all for now. I hope this was helpful. And hopefully we will see you soon. Bye for now. Thank you, Jude. That was great. The May meeting on Wednesday, May 26th is indeed the one where next year's books will be chosen. The Zoom link can be found on the Westwood calendar and on the Freethinkers page of the website. Further, we have an email alias, freethinkers at westwoodunitarian.ca. Freethinkers is all one word. You can send requests for information to that alias. Also, people can have their email addresses added to that alias if they want reminders, reading questions, and other items that are shared by members. With gratitude for our compassionate community, I invite you to join me in song. From you I receive to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Today's speaker Read the Reverend Ann Barker has been Westwood's minister for a number of years now. One of the many ways she serves our community is by delivering thoughtful and thought provoking addresses at about half of our Sunday morning gatherings. Over to you, Ann. Thank you. And uh, 13, 13 years. 13 is one of my favorite numbers. So I wanna say that if you were watching the slides and you have a small device or you had the slides really small and you couldn't see like the titles of the books that were being held up in that last video, you really wanna to go to the Freethinkers page on our website and watch it on one of your bigger devices because that was a great entertaining fun video and the book titles really, um, well, just, just go and watch it again. It's so fun. We'll begin with a poem by the Reverend Orlanda Brunola entitled, As We Move. As we move through life, finding ourselves, always newly wise and newly foolish, we ask that our mistakes be small and not hurtful. We ask that as we gain experience, we do not forget our innocence, for they are both part of the whole. Part one a confluence of mistakes. Nobody likes to be interrupted or told that they are wrong. These are the first words of the 2021 Confluence Lecture. I wrote them. I was talking at that moment about some of the lessons we learned as a congregation from the pandemic. Writing and recording the Confluence Lecture, being chosen by my colleagues to present the keynote address for this year's Canadian Unitarian Council Conference was a big deal for me. I felt responsible. I don't wanna let anyone down, least of all me. And I certainly didn't want to make mistakes because when you make mistakes, people interrupt what you're doing or what you have done and they tell you that you are wrong. Nobody likes to be interrupted or told that they are wrong. I was doing a brave thing. I interrupted the traditional format and filmed the lecture in parts, sermon length parts, each one with an accompanying invitation for the listener or the reader. It's available in print or in video, whichever you prefer. The questions at the end of each piece are downloadable. I'm a third generation settler 
white settler in this country, learning about colonization, learning about white supremacy, learning about my own entrenched biases and working to change. But you can't undo your heritage and you can't really unlearn something. You can, however, work to make different choices going forward. So I chose to take risks. My colleague, the Reverend Karen Fraser Gitlitz presented the last Confluence lecture, which means by tradition that she introduces the next speaker. We met over Zoom so she could ask me some questions and we talked about what it would mean to decolonize the introduction. Instead of the academic style of listing credentials and establishing the speaker's authority, we talked about what matters to each of us in life, where we come from, who and what we love. What are our commitments rather than our accomplishments? And we deepened our relationship. If you haven't already listened to the introduction video, I think you'll find it sweet and meaningful. Karen is a great partner in this work. We've been in a learning pod together for most of this year, taking the beloved congregations program, learning how to be partners and allies in intercultural work, and how to open ourselves to new cultural ways of being. So breaking up the lecture into three recordings, plus the fourth, the introduction, was born of my desire to find a new way of being. It's not just me talking for 50 minutes. It's three bites with an invitation at the end of each one and a request to work with that invitation before you move on to the next one. It's a way for people to participate with the lecture and to interact with it, not just listen. When we meet next Friday night after the CUC conference opening ceremony, instead of me giving the lecture and people just listening, instead we'll have a brief recap and then a conversation about people's experiences with those invitations. It seemed like a good idea until it seemed that almost no one got the memo. And my greatest fear was that everyone was gonna show up expecting the lecture on Friday and have no idea what was going on. You know those dreams of showing up at class and discovering there's a test you didn't know about? It's that kind of feeling. Anyone I asked said they had no idea it was out already or that it should be watched ahead. It was recorded in February. I wrote to my colleagues and I asked them to help get the word out, and they have. They are doing great work in their congregations. This is me telling you, if you're interested, it's all posted on the CUC conference website, and it's free. But still, I found myself filled with doubt. Maybe I'd made a mistake. Maybe this was a stupid idea. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Because that's what happens when we try new things sometimes. We worry that they will flop, that we were wrong, that we could have done a better job. And don't get me started about how scared I was to listen to it again two months later in case I discovered that I hated it or I had made some awful mistake. It's hard to work in a vacuum to put something out there and have no idea what people think. It's a lot different from watching your faces like I do when I'm speaking on Sunday morning or being able to see people squirming in their chairs when they get restless and know that you need to shift the tone. Before yesterday, the only two people that I had heard from about the videos were my best friend and a dear colleague, both who very bravely, kindly shared criticisms. And it turns out I didn't disagree with them. And I didn't actually mind hearing where they thought I had gone wrong. It was challenging, but I'm learning. And what courage it took for them to tell me, that means the world to me. Nobody really wants to be told that they're wrong. But we can learn to hear criticism with curious ears to be less defensive, to deepen relationship by taking the conversation far enough to find our agreements as well as our disagreements. There's more to talk about, but I feel safer because of their courage. 
Now I'm just going to post in the chat. If you want to find the Confluence Lecture, all you have to do is type into your search engine CUC Confluence Lecture 2021, and it will take you to the page that gives you access to four recordings, the print scripts, and the downloads of the invitations and the materials I recommend. The Swimming Lesson by Mary Oliver. Feeling the icy kick, the endless waves, reaching around my life, I, my life, I moved my arms and coughed and in the end saw land. Somebody, I suppose, remembering the medieval maxim, had tossed me in, had wanted me to learn to swim, not knowing that none of us who ever came back from that long, lonely fall and frenzied rising ever learned anything at all about swimming, but only how to put off one by one dreams and pity, love and grace, how to survive in any place. Part two reaching in. There are times when we need to reach out and times when we need to go within. Doubt and insecurity are times when we typically reach out for validation and it turns out those are really the times when we need to reach within. There was a part of me that doubted everything and a part of me that was proud of the work that I had done. And it turns out I can hold both of those things firmly at the same time because they are just parts. My work, according to Everett Considine, who teaches internal family systems, is to untangle myself from my parts. It's not about ignoring the parts. Feeling proud is important. And fear is a warning system. It's about making peace with them and seeing the value in them and not letting them take over, putting them at ease and if need be, letting them know that it's okay, I can handle things from here. I've always been uncomfortable with the Western way of trying to leap straight to overcoming doubt and insecurity or to just push past it. I know we need to feel our fear and do stuff anyway, but it turns out it's a whole lot easier if we actually connect with our fear and ask it, What's going on in there? What are you worrying about? I don't ever wanna look stupid. When it happens, it brings back all kinds of childhood insecurities magnified a thousandfold. Knowing that I can ask myself, does this work make me feel stupid? Okay, so maybe this isn't as bad as it seems. Will I feel stupid if people show up and haven't seen the videos? Well. Not really. I mean, it's printed right there on the registration material. View the videos ahead. And then I wrote to my colleagues. Instead of complaining that maybe the communication was, wasn't working, I just told them I needed help, that I was worried, and that could they help me? Turns out that felt really good, especially when they did. And I didn't feel alone in my worry anymore. 10 years ago, me would have said nothing, would have shown up Friday night feeling anxious and maybe angry about the promotion problems and faced the Q&A time already defensive. Decolonizing me is going to go to Friday night, to the Friday night event, feeling pleased with my work, but not too cocky since two respected colleagues have already helped me see that there are flaws. When we have resistance or defensiveness, when we feel anxious or embarrassed or ashamed, there is usually something underneath it that's getting in our way that needs to be uncovered, not squashed or pummeled into submission, but rather needs to be met with our care and our attention and maybe even professional help and definitely compassion. My scared parts were protecting me. My proud parts were protecting me too, but my calm centered self is able to hear both of them and reassure them that we can handle this, to thank them for their service and to carry on with the work. 
So we're going to take a break here and enjoy some music. Bring your broken hallelujah here. Bring your large one that is beyond repair. Bring the small one that's too soft to share. Bring your broken hallelujah here. I know that people have told you that before you can give, you have to get yourself together. They overstated the value of perfection by a lot, or they forgot. You are the gift. We all bring some broken things, songs and dreams and long lost hopes, but here together we reach within. As a community, we begin again. And from the pieces, we will build something new. There is work that only you can do. We wait for you. Bring your broken hallelujah here by the Reverend Teresa Ines Soto. Broken. The world is full of hard things, fear and violence and cruelty and shame. The CUC Dismantling Racism report came out this month and it's very important reading for us all. It teaches us a lot about Canadian Unitarian Universalism. It teaches us, especially the white people among us about what we don't see. And in this world, this world where George Floyd is suffocated by police, this world where in the middle of a global pandemic, people march unmasked, carrying tiki torches, shouting hate and threat at marginalized people, this world where it's not safe to ride public transit or park at the mall in Edmonton if you wear a hijab, this world where whole communities don't have access to safe drinking water, this world where it's perfectly acceptable to yell insults out your car window at fat or disabled people. In this world, we all have work to do. And the work begins within. How many of us are horrified by the experience of Indigenous people in this country? historically and today, but find ourselves held back by shame or guilt or fear of making a mistake. That's inside work. Learning how to hear criticism without being defensive, that's inside work. Summoning the courage to risk looking foolish, inside work again. We worry about not being good enough, not being effective, not knowing what to do, inside work. And when things go wrong, and they will, 
it's natural to go to our complicated places, our sticky parts, to try to maintain some semblance of equilibrium. Being white in Edmonton means that the system is gamed in my favor. I can feel ashamed of that or defensive about that or angry about that, but getting tangled up in any of these places makes me ineffective. We can do hard things. We know how to learn and grow. We're good at it. We are responsible for our culture, for perpetuating these systems, whether we see it or not, whether we caused it or not, whether we're interested or not. My best lesson this week has been that when my insecurities rise, I need help. I need to talk or work with people that I trust. If we don't have that in our lives, if we don't have those kinds of relationships, relationships where we're willing to be vulnerable so that we can get to the underlying truths, then we don't change. We stay stuck in our patterns. I can't speak for anyone but me, but these colonial patterns are crushing my soul. I won't stay stuck here anymore. I will do whatever I need to do to peel back my layers until I am useful and effective in dismantling racism. And as much as there is work to do in the world, there is also always inside work. Nobody likes to be interrupted or told that they are wrong. And as much as we would like to avoid those things, the path is actually through. Learning to be interrupted without defensiveness, learning to be wrong and learn from it and grow is our task. Embracing these is what we are called to do in the world. It is our turn to listen. I am not prepared to hear you say one thing and watch you do another without even mentioning it. I'm not talking about mistakes. You know we all make those. Sometimes we speak too little and think too little. We worry more about procedures than promises. We let fear and guilt keep our choices and actions small. Those things, common and human, keep calling us forward to different, better choices. I'm thinking of a different thing in which you know the right thing to do and in spend entire notebooks of calculations on figuring out how not to do it. Or conversely, you give it no thought at all. It's understandable that to learn the student must be ready. And if you choose not to be ready while the world cries out for your help, choose to linger in indecision and shrug off the human cost, you are wasting the gentle flexibility of grace. And as Frederick Douglass said, using your liberty for unholy license. You must account for this day, choose justice. You must account for your gifts, generate love. Your effort in community is a precious resource. Take courage, move with urgency toward every possibility. Please hurry, don't stop. Time for the work by the Reverend Teresa Ines Soto. Part four, it's the last one, the eighth principle. Something really big happened yesterday, really big. And it's partly right and partly wrong. And that's just how it is. Yesterday at the CUC annual meeting, the Dismantling Racism Task Force made a presentation and recommended that Canadian UUs adopt an eighth principle. Here are the words they've drafted for us. This is the preamble to the seven principles we had already. We, the member congregations of the Canadian Unitarian Council, covenant to affirm and promote. And then the new addition is individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. 
Let me read that for you again. Individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. An eighth principle, an anti-racist principle has been under discussion for years. It started in the US from Black Lives UU. The wording there was different. This was written specifically for our Canadian context, but the underlying point is the same. We live in an unequal society. And despite our seven profoundly meaningful principles, we have not committed ourselves and our institutions to this work. The Dismantling Racism Report made it abundantly clear that this is not just an American issue. The task force made this recommendation expecting that it would become a study question for next year. Instead, the delegates proposed a vote on the motion for this year. We've been talking about this for years but the rules of the CUC meeting don't allow for substantive motions from the floor. Well, unless you know the secret power, which the president of the CUC made sure everybody knew yesterday. And in true democracy, the power is always with the people. So delegates use the democratic tools within the system to effectively interrupt the meeting by voting to suspend the rules, which takes a two thirds vote and then voted by clear majority to adopt this as our eighth principle. It's not perfect. It's not ideal. Sure, there could be wordsmithing that can come back to next year's meeting. Sure. There would be value in a year of study, but we've had decades of conversation around the edges of this and no clear action. And our BIPOC folks, Black Indigenous people of color, leave us frequently over this. We have met in the basement at Westwood and debated the wording of the eighth principle, talked about if we would endorse it, talked about what we thought was right and wrong with it. We have clarified our position on race, that racism and oppression are wrong. If you could have seen the faces of the people in our movement, people who hold marginalized identities, listening one more time to why we needed to wait, well, if I was a delegate, I wouldn't have been able to vote no. I wouldn't have been able to vote that debating the language or discussing it for yet another year would be of more value than taking a bold prophetic action and declaring ourselves people who see the painful truth and people who will do something about it. For me, the eighth principle is accountability. It wasn't perfect, but it was beautiful. And it told our marginalized members who truly were shocked by the experience yesterday that we are paying attention. There is nothing stopping us from doing that education now. That will likely never end. It's just beginning. There's nothing stopping us from reaching in, deeply reaching within ourselves to root out our reservations and our fears and then find our centered selves, selves that can meet one another face to face in solidarity. I could not be more proud of our people. And I believe in my heart that the delegates who voted no did it primarily because they said so for process reasons. And I don't think that anyone in our movement wants to perpetuate racism. But if we did not know it before now, the distinction is becoming clear. It's not enough to not be racist. We are called to be anti-racist. 
And before we can ever be effective, it's an inside job. Blessed be and amen. If you want to bring your chalice or candle forward, this is the time. Our chalice extinguishing is the words of Lynn Unger, the way it is. One morning, you might wake up to realize that the knot in your stomach has loosened itself and slipped away and that the pit of unfulfilled longing in your heart had gradually, and without you really noticing, been filled in, patched like a pothole, not quite the same as it was, but good enough. And in that moment, it might occur to you that your life, though not the way you planned it, and maybe not even entirely the way you wanted it, is nonetheless persistently, abundantly, miraculously, exactly the way it is. We carry the spirit of community with us as we go about our week. Thank you for being with us this morning. Our community is enriched by your presence. Please join me now for our closing song. Wind Be Still, led by Rebecca Patterson. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, the Canadian Unitarian Council Conference is next weekend starting Friday evening. The opening ceremony, the Confluence Lecture 
and the Sunday service are all going to be live, live streamed on CUC's YouTube. So you could watch any of those at no cost without any registration. But if you would like to register and there are some fabulous workshops and uh, events and spiritually uplifting gatherings, all kinds of things with a sliding scale of really any price to attend. And if, if that any price is a barrier, free is fine. So I encourage you to check out the Canadian Unitarian Council website for the annual con or the by it's well for that conference. It's COVID. Who knows when we have a conference? The conference that's online registration for the conference closes tonight. So if you would like to register for anything, go there now. If you would, when you um, when we have the confluence conversation. I have questions for the audience and I suspect some of you will have questions for me. If you want to be in that Zoom room, you must be registered through the conference portal. You can watch it live on the live stream on YouTube, but we won't be able to see your comments or, or contributions to that. So reminder next Sunday, the link is in our Westwood calendar on May 16th. The Sunday service, we're joining the country for the national service. It's going to be wonderful. I'm really excited about it. I love these national services and it's at 11, starts at 11 a.m. Mountain time. So if you come here at 1030 and can't figure out why the meeting isn't on, then you have half an hour to find your way to the CUC.